We welcome you to Williamstown for one of college football's oldest rivalries, a tradition that began back in 1884. Amherst and Williams set to meet in the 136th edition of the biggest little game in America. Hi everyone and welcome alongside John Lawrence. I'm John Brickley. Harry Chickma is going to be joining us as well in just a moment. Uh, John, when you talk about some of the great rivalries in college football, you think of Harvard, Yale, you think of Michigan and Ohio State. Similar to those, this rivalry has also stood the test of time. Absolutely. It's uh, one of the great rivalries in all of college sports. It goes back to uh, 1884. We've had lots of great moments uh, from 2001 to 2013 where there was 13,000 people here, and we hope to forge some uh, great memories here again today. All right, let's spotlight the quarterback battle. Let's start with Williams. They've gone through a number of quarterbacks this year, but they found some success in Dan Vaughn. Yeah, Dan Vaughn came over as a runner. Uh, Bobby Mamoron was here as the starting quarterback. He decided he wanted to help out his team. Uh, he's been great after a couple of injuries to the two starters, and uh, he's been phenomenal, especially rushing. All right, on the flip side, you've got an Amherst team that's looking to a quarterback that's not your Major League Baseball version in Mike Piazza. Well, he's their version of Mike Piazza, though. He has been terrific, a Belmont Hill grad, and uh, this kid can run the football as well, and he's had touchdowns in uh, two of his, uh, rather, his last three games, so he's been phenomenal. So who will have bragging rights for the next 365 days? We will find out next. Amherst and Williams kickoff is coming up. Back at Williams College, overcast skies on this Saturday here in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Williams and Amherst, both two and six on the season. First time since 2016 that both teams enter this rivalry game on losing records. Williams won the toss, deferred to the second half. And the kicking duties will be handled this afternoon by Ivan Shuren for Williams. Back to receive Carter Young for Amherst. As we are set to go, the 136th edition of the biggest little game in America. Return taken at the 15-yard line and quickly wrapped up just before the 25-yard line is where the Amherst offense is going to begin this afternoon. Mike Piazza talked about it before, the junior, a dual-threat quarterback leading this offense, John, that's had their issues offensively second to last in rushing yards and last in scoring offense this season in the NESCAC. Yeah, it should be interesting to see because this uh, Williams defense is pretty stout, but uh, the Amherst defense has been fantastic this year. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how Piazza deals with this uh, rushing defense here for Williams. Man in motion is Owen Gatos. Jack Roberge in the backfield. Piazza to throw, far side of the field, pass complete for a one-yard gain to Roberge. And that was Campbell Pang, the first year out of Duxbury, Massachusetts, riding him out of bounds. Roberge, first down by Pang. So they're gonna call it no gain on the play. A second and nine, actually, with the ball placed on the 25-yard line. Back to either side of Piazza. This time they go to the ground. And a host of tacklers are there to meet Louis Echelkamp, the junior out of Washington, Missouri. Known to be a physical kid, 
according to head coach E.J. Mills. And it will be third and seven from the 28-yard line. Yeah, Echo Camp this year, 58 rushes for 232 yards. He's got one touchdown run on the year. And a nice job defensively there by number 97, Calvin Jackson. Amherst, 32% on third down conversions this year. Piazza flushed in the pocket and he's brought down. Number 93 on the sack, Ian Devine, one of the captains. Make that now his eighth sack of the year. Yeah, Ian Devine, a season high six tackles, four tackles for loss, including a couple of sacks last week at Wesleyan. Fantastic player. Last year was a first team all conference selection for Williams as Michael Mitchell on hand for his first punt of the game. And a short kick. And a lucky bounce that will stay inside the 45 yard line. And Williams College will start in Amherst territory on their first possession of the game. And for more, let's send it down to the third member of our team and Harry Chickma. Hi everyone, great atmosphere down here. You cannot beat the excitement field side on a New England game, one of the greatest rivalries. And I'm joined with Nick Sullivan, the assistant men's and women's golf coach for Amherst. You also went to Amherst, yeah. so tell me, as an alum, as a coach, how does it feel to be here in this amazing rivalry? Yeah, I mean, I've been to several of these games, so this is not my first time coming to the field here. And obviously at Amherst, it's always kind of the biggest day of the year. Um, my father is the public address announcer at Amherst for the football game, so I actually grew up coming to Amherst football. And that was kind of, when you're young, you don't realize what a special place it is. But as I got older, realized it was the place I wanted to go to school, got golf going, and uh, ended up here. And now I'm stuck here coaching. So uh, it's been a great ride. What about the rivalry? I mean, Williams-Amherst. Yeah. I mean, there's no love lost here, is there? No, uh, no love lost, but I think there is a lot of respect. I mean, we're very similar schools. And so uh, Amherst and Williams grads, there, there is that friendly rivalry, but we tend to get along. Um, on the golf course, it, it's always been fun. Uh, but these games get pretty rowdy, and, and today's a great atmosphere out here. How's the golf team doing? Awesome. Really, really awesome. Our women's team is ranked top 10 in the country, and our men's team had the best season in years in the fall. So we're excited to hopefully uh, win a couple NESCAG championships in the spring and go to the national championship. Well, enjoy this amazing game, Nick. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We're going to have interviews throughout the day down here with alums, also coaches and teams. Back up to you guys in the booth. All right, Harry, thanks so much. And, yeah, the, the rivalry in the history, not so much – for the coaches and the players, John, it also is in the stands with the fans over 136 years of a great rivalry that started uh, in 1884. So our first chance to see Dan Vaughn in this Williams offense and Williams unable to make a play there as Vaughn brought down for the sack by the senior outside linebacker, Tim Swope. Yeah, what a great job by Tim Swope. He was able to recognize what uh, Williams wanted to do offensively there and, uh, and so many different times during the season, able to get a sack on the quarterback. Swope, as you notice, he's been playing over two years with that club on his hand, but he has been one of the leading tacklers in that linebacking core this season for Amherst. So it's going to set up a third and long, just about four minutes into this opening quarter. Vaughn off of play action. Over the middle, pass complete. Brought down to the 25-yard line by Mike DeGasparis, one of the seniors that was honored before the game for Williams College. But short of a first down. Yeah, Mike DeGasparis, an Iona Prep graduate. Back in high school, broke a county record for reception as it is in his rookie season. It has had a great season here for Williams. He's one of the go-to guys for Vaughn. So Williams is going to go for it on fourth and one. They were number one in the NESCAC this year in fourth down conversion at 50%. Joe Nicholas to the right side of Vaughn. As Vaughn on the quarterback keep. Coming up close to that first down marker. We'll see if he had enough. Amherst saying that he was just short. Oh, 
and a timeout for a measurement. Well, the great part with Williams here is you got uh, those two players back there, Vaughn, who can run the football, and also Nicholas. So you really don't know where they're going to be coming from, but uh, Vaughn was the guy who took it that time. Looks like it depends on where they spot the football, but uh, it's going to be awfully close here. They're going to come out for a measurement, looks like. And that's one of the advantages, you'd have to say, John, about having Dan Vaughn under center, one of four quarterbacks to play this season. Jack Dickinson out with a season-ending shoulder injury. They've also had Jack Wallace, the freshman out of Trumbull, Connecticut, out because of injury. Nick Owens has also seen a series or two. And Vaughn, a matter of inches. And they're going to say he had enough for the first down. Amherst is going to obviously confront the referees on that yardage spot, but Otherwise, Vaughn key on that quarterback sneak to get the first down. Yeah, here's the guy who was number 10 in the Nest CAC in rushing per game. And uh, Dan Vaughn, again, a really tough situation for him, having the first two quarterbacks uh, being injured, having to come in to take a snap for the first time here and, uh, you know, this year, late in the year, and he's done a phenomenal job. First and 10 from the 25-yard line. Vaughn this time gives it off to Joel Nicholas. And Nicholas gets a couple of yards. Nicholas along with Vaughn, really the two-headed monster of this rushing attack this season for Williams that ranks second in the NESCAC in just over 150 yards per game. Yeah, one of his standout games was a game up at Colby, 18 rushes for 56 yards in that game. He's had a very solid, very steady, even season. Two wide out set, second and six after the gain of four. On the keep, Vaughn up the middle, marching his way through down near the 10 yard line, a first down for Vaughn, the senior quarterback that's the leading rusher for this Williams offense. And Charles McKissick and Luke Harmon, the two tacklers there for Amherst College, but again, another big gain here for Williams. They've been marching down the field. Lee into Gasparis, the two wide receivers. Now he's got Nichols in motion. Instead, Vaughn with the keep and pushes his way forward. And he'll set up second down. And Ben Taylor, the uh, sophomore out of Bowie, Maryland, 6'3", 280, there on the tackle for Amherst. And it didn't seem like Amherst was really fooled on that play. You saw Nicholas cutting right, but uh, they kind of knew that Vaughn was going to go up and take it himself. Three-yard three gain for Vaughn, who, in fact, spent more time in his career at Williams as a running back than he has as a quarterback. He's filled that role terrific. And again, kudos to him to stepping up here. On second down, they run again. This time it's Nicholas on the carry, brought down by three defenders from Amherst, including Charles McKissick in the secondary. And it will be third down coming up for Williams. Yeah, McKissick, uh, senior, he's from Littleton, Colorado. Had a season high seven tackles and a couple of pass breakups at Colby back on October 15th. He's uh, one of those real good defenders for Amherst. Williams has already converted on one third down on their opening series. This will be a third and three from the seven yard line. Nicholas again in the backfield. Vaughn moves right, finds a lane into the end zone for the touchdown, and it's Williams striking first. And what a great job there by Joseph Nabuwu, the left tackle. He created that room on that uh, rush there. Uh, again, as Vaughn was able to slip in from three yards out to get the touchdown. Outstanding job by the left tackle there for Williams. Vaughn with his fifth rushing touchdown of the season. As the lefty kicker, Shuren, on hand for the extra point. And Williams starting off this 136th edition of the biggest little game in America with a 7-0 lead thanks to the 7-yard rushing touchdown from quarterback 
Dan Vaughn. More to come from Williamstown in just a moment. John Brickley, John Lawrence back with you as Dan Vaughn, seven yard rushing touchdown has Williams College in front of Maris, seven nothing. While we have a chance, let's toss it down to the sidelines and Harry Chickma. Well, all the stars coming here to Williamstown, Massachusetts for this great rivalry. And how about the inaugural, the first ever Division Three men's national champions in crew from Williams and their coxswain, Piper. Higgins, Piper, congratulations to you guys winning the first ever national title in D3 crew. So tell me how it feels to be here. Thank you. I mean, it feels good to be back. I graduated last spring and winning the D3 IRA was a great way to end the year. Um, you know, feeling grateful that we ended the season that way and, and it's good to be back with my old teammates. So what was your role on the team guiding these guys to a national championship? Yeah, so I was a coxswain. A coxswain's a weird role. You, you steer the boat, so you're kind of like a quarterback jockey uh, character. And, um, you know, it, it was something I was doing for 10 years, and steering them down the line for the last time was great. Now you guys are going to try to defend your national title for Williams in the spring. What's it going to take to win, guys? Yeah, I mean, no, obviously, you know, still a strong crew. I graduated and we had our 3C graduate, but uh, they have everything they need to, to defend the title and just go a little bit faster this time. And who are you guys rooting for today? It's pretty obvious. Yeah. <laughs> go Williams Eves. Well, congratulations. The first ever Division Three national champions in men's crew. Let's send it back to you guys in the booth. Harry, great to see national championships being crowned here at Williams College. Great insight on the sidelines all day long. And as we saw Carter Jung, John with a very favorable game on the kickoff return. And so we see this offense once again for Amherst. Mike Piazza leading the way. There's a lot of threats for this team trying to come over those offensive woes. And this time on the pitch as Echo Camp, just a yard shy of the first down marker. Yeah, Carter Jung had a 36-yard kick return. He's number five in the NESCAC in kick returns, averaging about uh, just under 20 yards per return. But that was an outstanding one. 36 yards sets up Amherst in pretty good territory. Sets up a third and two from the 49-yard line of Williams. Handoff is to Robert's, and he is met by the front line of Williams College, denied on that third down opportunity. And there's the big guy again, Ian Devine, who read the play perfectly and was able to stop him right at the 50-yard uh, line. Outstanding play. Devine has been a big part of this uh, Williams defense already early in this game. And let's keep in mind as well, this defense has changed from last year. There are some missing parts to a defense that allowed just under 11 points per game, but when you have some depth like Ian Devine up front, that plays huge as a factor uh, for Williams' defense this season. So it's gonna be Mitchell out for his second punt of this first quarter, and a fair catch taken by Williams College. Great rivalry so far, seven nothing. Williams in front of Amherst.
overcast skies and what has come to be known as a typical New England day. We thought, John Lawrence, it was going to be about 70 after we saw the remnants uh, of the hurricane that hit Florida coming up all the way the coast to the northeast. Hasn't been the case so far, but a 7 nothing lead for Williams. And I thought it was interesting talking with Mark Raymond, their head coach this year. Uh, you know, he made the notion that this is all about the seniors and this is the seniors games and EJ Mills the head coach for Amherst who's been at the program for over 20 years made the point of saying this is the game that the players take to their graves. That's right because uh, you know for most of these players if not all of them this is going to be the final game they play for their college uh, career so this is really the thing that they're going to remember the final game of the regular season so and, and of course with a huge you know uh, rivalry with Amherst so. So ball is going to be spotted at the 17-yard line as Williams begins their second series of this first quarter. A handoff to Joel Nicholas for a two-yard gain, who last year, if you remember, set the single-season record in terms of touchdowns and points for this program. Yeah, he was uh, outstanding. 143 rushes, 750 yards, 16 touchdowns last year for Joel Nicholas and an outstanding uh, season for the uh, Eves in which they uh, won nine games. A native of Buffalo, New York, a huge Bills fan, by the way. As Vaughn, this time looking to throw, met with some pressure, ball tipped up in the air, intercepted by Amherst. What a play by junior linebacker Andy Skurzenski. And you know, it all started with the pressure that Tim Swope put on the quarterback there. He read the play well, forced him to throw that, threw it over his receiver, bounced out of his hands, right into the hands of Skrzynski, and an outstanding play. I mean, that was an acrobatic play to reach back and grab that. So that's going to be the second interception thrown this year by Vaughn. And great heads-up play by the junior linebacker to come up with the interception and look at the field position now for Amherst and Mike Piazza working at the 30 of Williams College. Four wide out. Piazza looking to throw far side of the field pass complete at the 20 yard line as Jung makes his way down to the 15 for a first down. Yeah, Austin Demel, the junior out of Darien, Connecticut, there on the tackle for Williams, but nice recognition by Piazza and a, a big first down. Like you said, they're in terrific position here to get a score. Piazza with a 16-yard pass completion to Jung, sets up a first and 10 at the 14-yard line. Man in motion, Piazza throws it into the flat, Roberts. Cuts it inside, brought down to the 10-yard line. Yeah, Tim Landolfi there on the tackle there for Williams. You, you may say, well, that really didn't gain all that much, but it's an important play just at least to get a couple of yards to get a little bit closer. Now they got a second down at seven. They can still get a first down without getting a touchdown. Roberts on the handoff, clipped from behind and taken down just short of the first down marker. Yeah, what an outstanding tackle there by Justice McGrail, the first year out of Methuen, Massachusetts. It looked like the initial rush, uh, I think it was Devine who was trying to come up and get Roberts, was completely fooled by the fact that he had the football and luckily, for the Eves, at least, McGrail was there to make the uh, tackle. Sets up a third and three from the seven. Let's see if this Williams College all, uh, defense can slow down Piazza in the Amherst offense. Empty backfield. Piazza's going to take it himself. Gets the first down and more. Brought down to the two-yard line. They're going to spot it at the three, but it'll set up a first and goal for Amherst. And the only thing that saved that from being a touchdown was uh, the play of the senior, Colston Smith, number 48. And you can see Piazza, he's just so slippery. He's able to kind of weave and, you know, weave his way through the defense, but a great job by Smith to recognize that and make the tackle. E.J. Mills made the point this week of saying that we put a lot on Piazza's plate to be the game manager 
that we know he can be. And these are spots that certainly build up the confidence for a quarterback like Piazza. So first and goal, Piazza on the keep, wrapped up for a loss. And again, there's Smith on the tackle, who leads that team in the category, does Williams. Yeah, we talk about Ian Devine, but Colston Smith, a big part of this defense too, and an outstanding job on two consecutive plays there to make the tackle. The senior out of Ridgewood, New Jersey, had a season-high 11 tackles at Wesleyan, along with a couple of sacks last weekend. Yeah, his 60 tackles on the season right now ranks second in the NESCAC. So a loss of three sets up a second and goal. But back to the other side of Piazza. Now Eichelkamp. As Eichelkamp closes in on the end zone. But again, we'll set up a, a third and goal here with a minute left to go in the first quarter. So it's Devine there and Tim Landolfi again uh, there to make the stop in. Boy, this is where your defense really shows its true colors. You know, when you're faced with a situation like this, when you're, you know, the team's right on the doorstep and Williams so far coming up pretty big. Piazza looking to throw, back of the end zone, touchdown! Carson Oxenhurt with the touchdown reception. Uh, Oxenhurt last year, two catches for 36 yards in the 24-19 loss at Amherst last year. And Oxenhurt comes up with a big catch here and great uh, recognition there by Piazza. Took his time, you could see his poise and you can see why Coach E.J. Mills is so impressed with him. Oxenhurt with his second touchdown reception of the season. Connor Canelli on hand for the extra point. And it's what you would expect in the 136th playing of the biggest little game in America. We are tied up at seven, Amherst and Williams College. A five-yard touchdown reception from Carson Oxenhurt has tied this one up between Amherst and Williams at seven apiece with just 29 seconds to go in this uh, first quarter. And again, defense turning into offense, the interception turning into a score for Amherst, and that's where we are, 7-7. Seven, seven. That's right. Uh, Piazza hasn't been uh, real prolific uh, throwing, but he's been very efficient. He's 4-4 four four for 24 yards, but great recognition again to be able to find, uh, again, a player open in the end zone for the touchdown. Terrific job by Piazza. Canelli the kick, and it will go to the end zone for a touchback, and so Williams will start from their own 25-yard line. So early on, impressions-wise, this is the game. Two and six teams, both have had struggles. Williams last year, we know, 9-0, and won the NESCAC with their perfect season. But again, rivalries change everything, John, don't they? They just change the dynamic regardless of the records. Yeah, they sure do. And, uh, you know, both teams being two and six, I think both coaches would probably agree that this is like their championship. Uh, the Trinity Bantams have wrapped up the uh, NESCAC championship. Uh, they have been outstanding this year. But again, a two and six record for both these teams. This is their championship game. 
So Dan Vaughn, the senior quarterback, back to work. Out of the gun for Williams. First play, Nicholas on the handoff. And a gain of two. Yeah, Nicholas just uh, five rushes so far, 13 yards. I'm sure he's going to get going pretty soon for this Williams team. Just a matter of uh, that offensive line trying to open up a few more holes for him to get through. This has been an offense, if you talk to Mark Raymond, has been dealt a number of injuries. That's why it's been inconsistent throughout the year. As Nicholas, again with the handoff, and quickly brought down for a short gain. Bobby Mameron, the four-year starter, graduated, and you talk to many of these players, he was on the Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks for Williams. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. First quarter coming to an end, Amherst and Williams tied up at seven. Amherst Williams tied up at seven as we start the second quarter. Let's go back down to Harry. What a game, Williams Amherst going head to head as we begin the second quarter. I'm here with a very special guest, the Hall of Famer in softball, the head Williams softball coach, Chris Herman, also assistant athletic director. How does it feel to be here seeing this amazing atmosphere on campus? Oh, it's so great. I mean, I'm so proud to be a part of the community at Williams and uh, here really today to represent the other coaches and all of the programs on campus. But it's, but it's awesome to see everybody come back on a nice warm day. And nearly 40 years in the NESCAC conference as a player coach. I mean, what does this conference represent to you and the competition out here today? Well, it really represents sort of the best of the best. I mean, up and down, we have, you know, four or five teams representing each sport in the NCAAs this this um, fall from the NESCAC. And uh, of course, I'd like to shout out to the to the Williams teams, but um, it's just an amazing place. And when I think about all the alumni that I've been, that I've worked with over the years and all the amazing cool things that they're doing and sharing back with our current students, it just really makes me proud. And coach, what can we expect from your softball team this year? Well, lots of great things. It's really uh, nice to be back on the field and sort of back in action after obviously a few years of, of uh, atypical uh, conditions, but we're really looking forward to it. Kids are working hard and uh, NESCAC's an amazing conference in softball as well. Well, best of luck, Coach. Enjoy the football, and thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Harry. Go eat. Back to you guys. All right, Harry, thank you so much. So a second and ten coming up for Williams. And again, this rivalry is not just showcased on the football field. It's also showcased on a number of sporting events as well. We've seen that throughout. You know the NESCAC better than anybody, John. Uh, and, and it's a rivalry where you want to win this game. You want that bragging rights for the rest of the season. Oh yeah, no matter what team it is out here, Amherst Williams is always the place to be. 
Nicholas once again with the handoff. And he gets out to the 40-yard line. That'll set up a third down opportunity. Going back to our point before, Vaughn replacing a four-year starter in Bobby Mameron, and he was a, a figure, a main figure of this offense for that four-year span. Talked about the Mount Rushmore quarterbacks at Williams. It's been a difficult challenge for Mark Raymond to try to get that quarterback in place this year. Yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a challenge for him when he first got here to Williams. His first season, he went 0-8, realized that he needed that uh, star quarterback. He got it with Mameron. Now he's trying to move on again, but uh, Dan Vaughn, again, just trying to provide that steady leadership here down the stretch. Vaughn wanting to throw on third and seven, sees the pocket collapse, and a number of defenders on hand for Amherst to make the tackle. Yeah, Ethan Birdo, sophomore out of Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Nice job there, number 45 for Amherst. And uh, that'll force uh, Williams to kick it off, and Tim Brown will come in to do the honors. Tim Brown, who last week had his longest punt of the season, 64 yards versus Wesleyan. As Cam Jones back to receive for Amherst. And Tim Brown is laid in 14 inside the 20 yard line this season. But not so here, obviously. That one's short, out of bounds, and it'll be good field position set up for Amherst in a game that's tied up at seven apiece. Yeah, Williams is looking for their 75th all-time win in this series. They lead the series 74, 56, and 5. Get the first meeting coming back all the way in 1884. Williams winning that matchup 15 to 2. And this rivalry has seen some amazing games go back to 1995. The game that ended in a 0-0 tie, the last game in Division Three to end in a tie. We've also seen College Game Day here on campus before. As Piazza back to work on the keep, brought down at the 47-yard line. And probably the, one of the most exciting games was in 2001, that overtime thriller where Williams won 23-20. Both teams at the time were 7-0, and that was just an outstanding game to be at. And these games at Williams College over the last few meetings have been in favor of the East. You go back to 2017, one in overtime, 2019. Could that trend continue? here this afternoon. Offset eye as Piazza working with eight on the play clock, second and four. Off of play action, a miscommunication. Was looking for Jack Betts, the junior out of Dallas, Texas, but an incomplete pass sets up third down. Yeah, Betts going right, the pass uh, going more up toward the middle, but he was pretty well covered downfield as uh, Brant Mandia was there defensively looking to uh, maybe get an interception, but that was way overthrown, obviously. Both teams two for four on third downs. This one a third and four from the 47. Four wide out set for Piazza. Over the middle, pass complete to the 45. Diving ahead is Jung, and it'll be a first down for Amherst as they move the chains. Yeah, Justice McGrail there on the tackle, number 35 for Williams, but an outstanding job again by Piazza, and that uh, really silenced the crowd a little bit. You can see the crowd starting to get on their feet, thinking that maybe the Eves would get a stop defensively. Piazza's four for five in this first half passing. And in our conversations this week with uh, E.J. Mills, the head coach for Amherst, he, he spoke about the fact that they don't have a dynamic wider receiver this season. Well, Piazza a couple of games ago against Bates was passing at 80%, 20 of 25. Piazza this time on the keep, eludes one tackler, and he is brought down at the 40-yard line, and it'll set up second down. And he definitely would have got a first down there if not for the quick uh, thinking there of Ian Devine, who just was able to wrap him up with the legs here. You could see Devine just getting a piece, but if not, it looked like he was off to the races there for at least a first down. A real dominant force. That's what his head coach has described Ian Devine as, one of the senior captains, as Piazza got a gain of four on that last rush. Running back to either side of Piazza. Roberge on the handoff. 
And he is brought down for a gain of about three. Again, Devine leading the way. George Papadopoulos also in on the tackle, number 17 there for Williams. At least it makes it a little manageable more now. Third down and two. And a timeout taken. And so Amherst will talk it over with a third and two coming up, tied up at seven in the 136th playing of the biggest little game in America. Five minutes into the second quarter, Amherst and Williams tied up at seven as we go back down to Harry Chickma. Welcome back here, great game going on, and I'm with a superstar in field hockey, a senior, Sarah Edelson, who also represented Team USA in the Maccabi Games, and you're a scholar. You finished second in the country in an essay competition. So tell me about the full athletic and academic experience at Amherst. It's been amazing to be able to pursue all my interests from the field hockey team to the jazz ensemble to the architectural studies and economics double major. It's really been amazing to be able to do everything that I love and be supported by such a wide variety of people from across the college. And how did Amherst get you ready to compete for Team USA at the Maccabi game? All of my teammates were very supportive, playing with me throughout the spring. My coaches were following along with the games and being able to be with six other Amherst athletes throughout the games and numerous other NESCAC athletes was just amazing. Um, so I had the most fantastic time ever representing Amherst in the United States. Field hockey season approaching, so how ready are you for this? Our season was awesome. We won the Little Three this year for the first time in a couple years, which was really great to be able to bring back the title for the team. And it was just a great season overall, finish on a very strong note. One more question, this game's amazing. One of the most historic games in college sports. What's it gonna take for your team to win over Williams? I think everybody has come in ready to win the third game of the season. It's super exciting that this is the last game of the season and the biggest little game of America. We have a lot of alumni here today and a lot of players took the drive up from Amherst. So definitely exciting time and the energy is, energy is just great already. Well, congratulations uh, with your senior year. Also the SA competition and Team USA. Best Thank of luck you. for the rest of the year. Thank you. Back to you guys. So we saw just moments ago, uh, right there, John, a pass interference call, the first flag of the game. Defensive uh, pass interference going against Williams. So Amherst really in a strong position now with the ball spotted at the 18-yard line in a first and 10. Yeah, it really wasn't uh, necessary there for Williams to take that penalty, to be honest. Echelkamp with the stiff arm, but three tacklers bringing him down, including that senior linebacker, Colson Smith. We have heard the senior captain make numerous plays so far in this first half. Yeah, Colston Smith has been outstanding. Another great job there recognizing the play and uh, managed to bring him down right at the line of scrimmage. No gain after that uh, big pass interference call against the Eves. So we'll see if uh, this offense here for Amherst can continue to chug down the field here. It's uh, again, it's struggle only s scoring 12 points per game through the course of the regular season. Man in motion, play Zachary, the tight end for Amherst. Piazza wants to throw. 
Forcing out of the pocket. And far side, the pass incomplete. Great pressure up front by Ian Devine, but there is a flag on the play. And it's going to be holding going against Amherst. Yeah, you see uh, Piazza was really having to scramble there after Ian Devine had just uh, just rushed him, and he had to really rush to throw that pass and uh, incomplete pass. And, of course, the holding call here, too, will really hurt Amherst. Edward Roos, our head referee for today. Yeah, it looks like it was Brace Martin who gets uh, called for that. And you can see he was just holding up Devine just enough, and uh, that, that's where the call came from. And that's one of the issues this year for E.J. Mills is the fact that that front line is, is not physical. It's, it's uh, a group that's certainly uh, trying to gain experience as the season goes along. So second and 20 after the penalty. Piazza rolls out, finds a wide receiver in the form of Oxenhurt. Who's already got a touchdown to his credit. And it'll set up third down for Amherst. There's George Papadopoulos, number 17, over there to uh, make the tackle. Another nice job there by Piazza. He was being pressured big time by Tim Landolfi to get rid of that, and he found an open receiver, at least to get a few yards back. Gets it back to a third and 10 after the 10 yard completion. Empty backfield for Piazza with under eight minutes to go in this first half. Piazza again, far side of the field, complete to Roberts. He's going to be about three yards short of the first down. And so a crucial fourth down coming up for Amherst. And I like what Roberts did right there, just uh, trying to spin just a little bit, put the ball a little bit farther ahead so the spot will be a little bit closer here for Amherst to, at least for their field goal kicker here, to try to get uh, the uh, extra points up on the board to take the lead. It's going to be approximately a 27-yard field goal for Connor Canelli. Recently named the NESCAC Special Teams Player of the Week. And the kick is good. So Amherst, after the great field position, takes their first lead of the game. 10-7 over Williams, 7-0-1 left to play in this first half. Back with you at Williams College, John Brickley alongside John Lawrence and Harry Chickma. Here's a look at the series history in the biggest little game in America, the first one that was played back in 1884. And for the first time since 2016, both these teams coming in with losing records. But, John, I always talk about the history of a rivalry like this. you got to go back to 1821 when the Williams president resigned his post, became the first president at Amherst, and then ever since then, supported having Williams trying to move further east. Instead, the town of Williamstown said, no, 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 we're keeping Williams here. And that's how this rivalry has, has come about for 136 years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you said you go back to 1821 with that. And uh, it, it is just a fantastic rivalry that has spanned the generations. And it just seems to be getting more intense as we go along. So Amherst. Just capped off a nine play 48 yard drive with the field goal by Connor Canelli, who is now eight for 11 on the season. And they have taken their first lead of the game having now scored 10 straight. 
looking to snap what would be a mini two game slide in this rivalry. Canelli back to kick. And it will be a touchback. And so Williams will start with 7 01 left to go in this second quarter from their own 25 yard line. Yeah, Canelli has been terrific from that range of uh, 20 to 29 yards. Also has been great in the 30 to 39 yard range. He's four of four on the season. So he's uh, he's been really good. The only one he missed was a 50 plus yarder, which was earlier in the year at uh, Wesleyan University. So Vaughn and the East offense back to work, down by three, first time trailing in this game. Vaughn on the pitch to Nicholas. Cuts the corner, past the 40-yard line, and brought right down on the near side at the 45-yard line. A first down and more for the talented senior back. Well, you knew that Nicholas was going to get his game going, and, it, you know, this is a team game, of course, and Michael Bedard, the junior out of Barrington, Illinois, he did a fantastic job of creating all that room for him. 20 yards on the play off the run from Nicholas, biggest yardage gain and run of the day for the senior back. Sets up a first and 10 from the 45-yard line. Vaughn. Brought by the line of scrimmage for a loss of one, anticipating that the entire way was the freshman outside linebacker, Matt Montelion, whose brother Ryan is also a member of this team as well, part of the defensive unit. And it sets up a second and 11. Yeah, it looked like Montelion was not going to be able to take him down initially, but uh, he stayed with it. And a good thing for him there, too. He made Williams lose a yard on the play. Nicholas, the handoff, brought right back to the line of scrimmage. So you can see, obviously, the adjustments made. Phil Slaughter there on the tackle, number 99 in white, coming off the field for Amherst. And it looked like there was a little bit of confusion on that play between uh, Nicholas there and Vaughn. Didn't look like they set it up that way, but ended up getting maybe a yard or two back. Third and nine, ball spotted at the 46-yard line as we approach five minutes to go in the first half. Nicholas cuts it to the outside, brought down at midfield. Yeah, outstanding job by Andy Skrzynski there for Amherst. Really looked like uh, they were going to get some positive yardage out of the play, but Skrzynski with a nice job from behind to be able to get that tackle. Nicholas so far today, 11 carries for 53 yards. That last carry for six, not enough for the first down, and so Brown back out for another punt for Williams. Jones back to receive for Amherst. Yeah, Jones uh, leading the conference in punt return yards on the season, so he's a guy to watch, but of course, have to worry here. A great punt by Brown inside the 15-yard line, spotted at the 13. So special teams playing a factor here for Williams, down by three with 4.42 left to go in this first half.
A 37-yard punt by Tim Brown as Amherst will begin with possession and the lead at their own 11-yard line. John Brickley, John Lawrence, and Harry Chickma with you here from Williamstown, Massachusetts, the 136th edition of the biggest little game in America, one of the great rivalries in college football. Yeah, and this will really work well for Amherst if they can just come away with a three-zip advantage here in this quarter. They've been outscored by opponents 23 to nine in the second. And this series off the handoff. As it will be a gain of three, second and seven coming up for Amherst. You talked about uh, an Amherst team that really has had some struggles this year closing out games. They've had six losses this year by an average of nine points. So either way, in terms of execution, games going their way in the end has been the difference telling the story this year of why this team is two and six. Yeah, you can't ask for more than their defense of what they provided this year. The offense, though, is where they have definitely struggled this season. Piazza on the keep, and he brings it diving ahead towards the 20-yard line. Tackle made on the play by Calvin Jackson, the junior out of New Rochelle, New York. And it'll be a third and two spotted at the 20-yard line. Chaz, I was going to say Chaz Cotton, also part of that, too. He's uh, from Los Angeles, 26 solo tackles and 18 assists. He's got one sack this year, too. That came against Wesleyan University. Amherst, four for seven on third downs. Man in motion is Gatos. Piazza looking to throw into the flat, complete to Roberge, who fights his way towards the first down marker, but a great defensive effort on the play there by Williams to force the fourth down. Yeah, we called this guy's name a few times, Tim Landolfi out of Duxbury, Massachusetts. And he had an outstanding uh, game against Wesleyan University recently, 12 tackles, which was a season high for him, one block kick, and that was played on the road at Wesleyan University. So with no gain on the play, brings out the punting unit and Michael Mitchell. He's been averaging just under 36 yards per punt this season. And it will be downed at the 48 yard line of Williams. And that is where Dan Vaughn and the offense for the Eves are going to work with 2.05 left to go in the first half. It's interesting to note, too, for this Williams program, think about Mark Raymond in his sixth year guiding this program. First season, Williams went 0-8, and they've made the transition to trying to be a better program. We've seen that happen last year with that 9-0 perfect season, winning the NESCAC. But again, star players that have graduated not on the field playing a factor this season. Well, big part was with it, he was able to uh, do some great recruiting this year. Here's Nicholas, cuts it to the outside for a first down and more. What a breakaway speed by Joel Nicholas, the senior out of Buffalo, New York. We've mentioned his name a number of times, but that gets it into Amherst territory and a first down. Yeah, Charles McKissick there on the uh, tackle, but again, you could tell that uh, Nicholas was just kind of warming up here and getting ready to go. and. He's really started to uh, come on here in the last, uh, well, at least this quarter. It's been fantastic. A gain of 17, 12 carries for 70 yards for Nicholas in the backfield. Has been a force to be reckoned with this afternoon for Williams. On first and 10, Vaughn wants to throw. And a miscommunication on the route by Cameron Lee, incomplete, sets up second down. Yeah, Cameron Lee has been one of his uh, favorite targets so far this year, along with DeGasparis. But again, it's been mostly the running game this year for Williams. But when Vaughn has been able to find some open receivers, a lot of times it is those two on the right side there, DeGasparis and Lee. And these are the moments that if you're a Williams fan, the name Frank Stola comes to mind. One of the top wide receivers from last year's team. And his brother plays uh, for Middlebury College right now. As Vaughn with the carry. Brought down at the 
31 yard line. We saw that hot start on the opening series that led to Williams striking first, but it seems that they've cooled off and now the momentum has swung the way of Amherst. Yeah, and you know, I, I said about uh, Amherst, they have been outscored by opponents 23 to nine in the second. On the other side of that, Williams have outscored opponents in the second 82-52. So this has been a traditionally good quarter for them. Just two for five on third downs in this game, Williams has converted on. Two wide out set to the far side of the field. Vaughn again looking to throw. Pressure up front and met by Ethan Burdo with the big hit on Vaughn. Burdo with his first sack of the season and it sets up a fourth down and the punting unit back onto the field for Williams. Outstanding job by the sophomore out of Cold Spring Harbor, New York, Ethan Burdo, who had a couple of tackles at Tufts a few weeks ago. Comes up with a big sack here against Vaughn. How many times have we seen in this first half defensive plays made at crucial junctions of the game by Amherst? Interception, sacks, another one there forcing the punt by Brown. And perfect placement on the punt by Tim Brown as Amherst is going to be Gim Sear own one yard line. You know, some people think that a game like that where you have these good defensive stops that uh, maybe it's not the most exciting. To me, it's really exciting. I love a good defensive struggle like this. I, I think it's one of the more exciting things you could watch. So Amherst is going to have 17 seconds to work with from their own one yard line and a three point lead after scoring 10 unanswered from Williams opening series drive that led to a touchdown. This time the run that gets down to the five yard line and that should be the final play of the first half. Yeah, Robert had to jump over one of his own linemen to get a couple of more yards there as time expires. It's what you would expect in a rivalry of this magnitude, the 136 playing of the biggest little game in America, Amherst, with a three-point lead on Williams at the break in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Welcome back here. This is NCAA football paradise, one of the greatest rivalries in the history of college sports. I'm Harry Chickma. Welcome back. Halftime, Williams versus Amherst football, and we have a great game here. And I'd like to join the guests of honor, the presidents of both universities, Michael Elliott from Amherst and Maude Mandel from Williams. Well, presidents, thank you so much for helping to make this game possible. So talk about uh, just the excitement out here. It's it's great to be here. This is my first Amherst Williams game as president, and the energy is really electric. Yeah, I think the entire campus is here. I'm hoping the stands won't collapse with all the energy. It's really been great. And these are just amazing athletes, but also great student athletes. So how important is an education at a university college such as Williams and Amherst? I mean, an education here is everything. These are students who want to be on campuses where they can learn for life. They're not just about getting a job, they're about having a terrific life no matter what happens to the workforce and the future of the economy. Yeah, and one of the things we really value, I think, on both of these campuses is having robust 
the best and most robust learning programs we can, also tremendous athletic programs that bring students together to do their best at both, but also in music and in the arts and in all these areas, so that cross-liberal arts education is what we're really looking for inside and outside the classroom. And really a hot topic is the affordability of colleges. So many kids can't afford college, but you guys give so much financial aid, both universities. Tell me about that. Um, so it is true that the tradition of access and affordability at uh, Williams has been a long tradition and is a top priority. We have moved to a full grant program which supports students without loans and without work study for all their years here. And that really is so that we can ensure that we anybody who wants a Williams education can afford it and can take advantage of all the opportunities. Amherst and Williams are rivals on the playing field, but this is a shared commitment that we have as institutions. We really believe this form of education should be available to anybody, and we've made incredible strides. We're fortunate to be at institutions where the alumni have invested in that vision of the future, and we feel both really lucky to lead places like that. And how about this game? I mean, really, both going for your third win of the year, and it's competitive out there, so what are your thoughts? It's a tight game, and it's a defensive struggle, and I think that favors the Mammoths. And yet, there I might differ uh, and say we're, we're waiting for that second half to bring it home here at Williams. So it's really exciting to be here together. Well, congratulations, Michael Elliott, Maude Mandel, the respective pre presidents for Williams and Amherst. It's an honor to be here with you, both on the field and in the classroom. You guys are doing great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Back up to you guys. Hi everyone, Harry Chickma. Halftime here, Williams Amherst going at it. Great game in Williamstown, Massachusetts. I'm joined with Lisa Melendy, the athletic director for Williams, hosting this amazing and historic battle. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's a great day. We're glad to have you here. We're glad you could come. See what's going on here on the field. It's always a, always a great battle. And this is a wonderful game. What are your thoughts so far on this amazing rivalry? Yeah, it's, again, it's always so fun. The crowd's great. We've 
the rain cleared. We're super excited. It's always great to have Amherst come visit us on our field. We're hoping we can take away a victory at the end, but right now it's just, a, again, a battle as it always is every year between these two great teams. Undoubtedly, Williams, one of the greatest athletic and academic institutions in the country, especially for Division Three. How have you been able to maintain that excellence? It's really the people that are here. Um, you know, we start with great leadership, and uh, hopefully that works its way down, um, I guess, in both directions. Um, great students that we are able to attract and bring to campus that are just curious, smart, uh, engaged, energetic. They really want to pursue excellence in everything they do, and, and they demand that of the institution. And it's just a, a collaborative effort that just brings out um, a lot of great a great outcomes for us all. The facilities look absolutely beautiful. I see the tennis courts have improved a lot since I came here and, and uh, played some tennis years ago. So tell me, um, what are you guys doing to just improve, in general, the athletics? Yeah, again, it's constant. Um, you know, conversation, first of all, what can we do differently? What's new in the world? I mean, it, you know, we don't, it's not stagnant outside of us. So, right, it's keeping up with the trends uh, elsewhere in the athletic field, high school, club sports, and so on. And then what are, you know, facilities wise, what are other folks doing? We're just finishing up with a, um, it's not really a master plan, but it's sort of a look at the entire campus to think about what kinds of facilities we might build going forward for the whole campus. So again, a really comprehensive look. Um, athletics will be a part of that. So we're excited about that. As you know, we just redid our tennis courts. This, uh, place is about almost 10 years old now, uh, so we're excited to, to add some new new facilities for our students to, to participate in, and the whole campus actually. It's really about the whole community. And what do you look for in a student athlete? I mean, it's much more than just excellence on the field. It's everything, isn't it? Yeah, it's really that drive to be better, and as I said earlier, curious, uh, wanting to be a good community member, really wanting to be a part of a team, because uh, everything we do is collaborative in the classroom, on the field, and so somebody who knows how to, how to work with other people and is interested in doing that is really a lot of what we're looking for. And what's it going to take to pull through and take down Amherst here? It's going to be tough. Yeah, we need some defensive stops, I can see, and I can put together a couple of good plays. And a little luck, as you see. You know, they got a tip and an interception changes the game. So we're hoping for, for a few breaks like that ourselves. Well, congratulations, and thanks for being a gracious host here. It's amazing. Oh, certainly. We're glad to have you. You heard it from the boss here, the athletics director for Williams College. I'm Harry Chickma. We'll be right back. Watching it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Harry Chickma here in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Amherst up 
10-7 at halftime against their rivals. And I'm with Don Falstick, the athletic director for Amherst College. And great to see your team's playing well. What are your thoughts so far in this uh, approach in the third quarter? Yeah, no, it's been a good game so far. And uh, we're lucky that we they had a kick into the wind and we got the turnover. And so we'll see when we can when they flip the wind side if we can hold in there. But pretty good game. And, you know, this rivalry goes back so many years. I mean, what does this mean to you? both universities and just really everyone. Yeah, this is just an amazing rivalry just to have two great academic institutions who have the best students in the world almost, and then to be able to compete um, at the national level or compete against each other, it's just really special. And Amherst College, one of the great academic institutions, also one of the great athletics institutions, how do you maintain that excellence? Well. Amherst is Amherst, and we have just great academics. Our faculty is amazing, um, and we just get great kids who really want to challenge themselves in the classroom, but will also want to um, be great athletes and work at their work at their sport or other affinity areas. So we're just lucky that uh, fingers crossed we can keep it rolling. And any new and exciting initiatives taking place, facilities, anything else to look forward to? Um, yeah, we've, we've done some stuff in our gym where we are putting up some touch screens um, for our alumni photos that we've had, and um, it's going to be great. We digitized a lot of the older photos, um, and so that's that's pretty cool. And, um, yeah, we're keeping our, trying to figure out what else we need, to, but things are looking pretty good there. Well, you're up by three right now. What is it going to take? This would be a huge win, your third of the year, definitely momentum for the rest of the season. So how can you take down your rivals from Williams? Yeah, we just gotta we just gotta can't turn the ball over. You know, right now I think that's the thing. Um, if we can do that, if we can if we can stay there, we're gonna be okay. Well, the football gods are smiling. A perfect New England day here. I know you're happy about that. Absolutely. This, like I was saying earlier, this is probably the best day it ever. It's been in um, this late in at Williamstown, so this is awesome. And I know everyone's having a good time. It's a great environment. Well, Don Falstead, congratulations. Amherst College Sports alive and well. All right, thank you. You heard it from the athletics director. Much more coming up here on the broadcast. Second half action coming up. I'm Harry Chickman. We'll be right back from Williamstown, Massachusetts.
at the half, Amherst with a 10-7 lead on Williams in the 136th playing of the biggest little game in America. John Brickley back with John Lawrence, and it's kind of that game we expected in a rivalry game, especially with two teams who have struggled this year with two and six marks. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, Amherst has got that uh, great defense here in the NESCAC, so I expected them to be stout and really holding Am uh, rather Williams down a number of times, and they've just been outstanding defensively. Williams, it seems like Joel Nicholas is starting to get his uh, running game going a little bit here. And, of course, with Vaughn, Vaughn is always outstanding too. So uh, it should be an interesting second half. Well, as we saw in the opening series, and we'll get to some of the highlights of this first half that we saw Dan Vaughn led the charge with his seven yard rushing touchdown and we thought it was going to be Williams Day. Amherst though has played differently especially strong on the defensive side. Yeah you see Ben Taylor there with that uh, sack of Dan Vaughn and here is Vaughn again and Vaughn able to get through for the touchdown run here for Williams to take the early lead here in this game and Vaughn was uh, well pretty efficient in that first half. Uh, 12 rushes for 70 yards in that first or and here is uh, Piazza with a touchdown pass there to uh, Oxenhurt. And that's Damn. been the difference so far defensively. Amherst forcing an interception that led to that touchdown. Also, a couple of sacks in the backfield against Vaughn. And 10 straight unanswered by Amherst has them up by three. That's right. And uh, Connor Canelli, great job there getting the field goal for Amherst College. And again, you see Piazza here with his... Uh, Terrific play as uh, we'll take a look at the Canale field goal here. And again, he's been great so far this year in that respect. And, you know, with Amherst getting outscored by such a huge margin in the second quarter, uh, Coach E.J. Mills has got to feel real good that he's got a 10-7 lead heading into the second half. And I thought it was interesting in the conversations that we had this week with Coach Mills. He was adamant in saying that the kicking game will be crucial. And what a performance we also saw by Joel Nicholas in that first half. 12 carries for 70 yards and the defense though has been the story each and every time we've seen them come up with big plays in the form of Amherst. That's right another one there from Ethan Birdo number 45 for Amherst he was uh, one of the great defenders there in the first half and Amherst looking good at least defensively here in this game. All right so there it is Amherst and Williams separated by three points we will step aside get you set for the third quarter when we come back.
Back at Williams College, John Brickley, John Lawrence, and Harry Chickma with you. Once again, the 136th playing of the biggest little game in America. Williams trying to make it three straight home victories as we take a look at Dan Vaughn getting set for the start of the third quarter where he and the Chiefs offense will start things off. Adjustment-wise, John, what do both teams have to do in the second half to uh, try to pull out the victory? Well, I think uh, for Williams, they really got to get the ball in the hands of Joel Nicholas. He, uh, again, started really running the football well in that second quarter. I think he's going to be a key for Williams. I think for Amherst, you got to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, just keep getting the big plays from players like Ethan Birdo and uh, try to stop that uh, running game, especially from Nicholas. So again, Williams won the toss, deferred, will have possession to start off this second half. Both these teams, two and six on the season. One will come away with bragging rights for the next year in this great historic college football rivalry. And fair catch as Williams will begin the third quarter from their own 25 yard line. You know, Williams has done real well here at home this year, two and two, where they really struggled was on the road. They were 0 and four on the season. And Amherst, again, they struggled in their first five games. They had lost their first five and last three games, they've won two out of three. So they've uh, really kind of poured it on the last uh, part of the season here. Vaughn on the toss to Nicholas. Near side, past the 30-yard line, finally brought out of bounds near the 35-yard line. We've talked about the type of performance numbers-wise Nicholas put up in that first half, and he's doing so because they are shorthanded in the backfield. Mario Vachetti out in a walking boot. He was a big loss this season uh, early on. Out, and so Nicholas has been taking a, a brunt uh, of the run game. Yeah, and he got a real nice help there from Michael Bedard. It looked like Tim Swope was going to come in and get the tackle on him pretty early, but it was a great job by Bedard to uh, open up some space. Nicholas with a nine-yard run, sets up a second and one from the 34. Nicholas up the middle, and he is met by a host of Amherst tacklers and brought down at the 38-yard line, so a first down coming up for Williams. Yeah, we've called uh, Ben Taylor's name a few times today, number 35 for Amherst. Nice job there on the tackle. And uh, Talon Gorelli for uh, Williams did a nice job of at least opening up a little bit more room to be able to get that first down. Nicholas, who came into this game with just over 371 yards rushing, is closing in on a 100 rushing yard game this afternoon. Vaughn on the keep to the 47 yard line. Nice gain on the quarterback keep by Dan Vaughn. And again, that's where the two headed monster plays a fact. You've got Vaughn and Nicholas to contend with if you're an opposing defense. Yeah, it makes it really tough to figure out who's going who's gonna to take it. And Nicholas and Vaughn do such a great job on that, uh, you know, just kind of obfuscation where they, you know, you don't know who's going to grab the football. And uh, great job there by Vaughn. Nine yard run sets up a second and one for Vaughn out of the gun. Toss on the sweep to Nicholas. Gets the first down and more near the 40 yard line out of bounds in front of the Amherst bench and it'll be another first down and the chains moving for Williams College. Nice job by Ryan Monteleone getting the tackle there for Amherst driving him out of bounds. Nicholas has been averaging almost six yards per carry in this game. In Amherst territory, Vaughn met up front by Amherst, anticipating that it's going to be a loss as Angelo Federa on the tackle, the junior out of Galloway, New Jersey. Yeah, Federa looked like he didn't really hit him very hard, but it was enough to take uh, Vaughn down. Did get some help from some secondary uh, lineman back there, but uh, nice job by Federo. Going to be a loss of three. Vaughn, pass complete. 
Nicholas near side out of bounds at the 36 yard line close to a first down. Yeah, real nice job on the stiff arm there by Nicholas as there was really no one over there. It was a basically one on one coverage. Quickly back to the line. Vaughn working with a third and two. Williams has struggled on third down in this game, just two for six. On the give, Nicholas eludes one defender. First down and more as he cuts it to the outside. Dives past the 30-yard line. It'll be a first down coming up for Williams. Yeah, he was able to avoid one tackle there as Ryan Monteleon thought he got a piece of him, but then it finally took a combination of players, including Swope, to get the tackle. 16 carries for Nicholas for 99 yards. He has been instrumental in this drive as a first and 10 from the Amherst 29-yard line. On the toss, Nicholas again. Tries to beat his defender, Swope, who was there on the tackle. Well, that was great recognition by Swope. I thought Michael Bedard there for Williams was going to provide enough uh, room there for the run, but uh, a great job again by the Amherst defense to stop that run. Swope, who is a member of the ROTC, trained in Arizona, plans to join the Special Forces after graduation. Yeah. On second and 10, off of play action, Vaughn finds a wide open to Kasparis in stride, corner of the end zone, touchdown! 29 yards on the touchdown pass from Dan Vaughn to a fellow senior in Mike DeGasparis. And Williams has retaken the lead. Well, so much for the running game being the key to this uh, third quarter. This time it's Dan Vaughn, who just a couple of games ago was the NESCAC Offensive Player of the Week and showed it right there with a great pass to DeGasparis. Sharon on hand for the extra points. And Williams striking first in this third quarter, 14 to 10, now in front of Amherst. And one more look at it. DeCasparis in stride, comes up with a touchdown, and Williams in front as we take a timeout. Williams with a nine play 75 yard drive to open up the third quarter versus Amherst ending with a 29 yard touchdown pass from Dan Vaughn to Mike DeGasparis. His second touchdown reception of the season and more importantly Williams as they started off this game with a touchdown up 14 to 10. Yeah, Mike DeGasparis with a touchdown catch versus Tufts back on October 1st. And coming up with a huge one here against the big rival Amherst and his longest catch of the year, 36 yards, but a great 27-yard catch there. It'll be Shuren on hand 
to kick it off for Williams. And a short kick taken by Jones, but a fair catch was signaled. And while we have a chance, let's send it back down to Harry. Thanks so much, John. All the stars coming from both schools. We have Kate Pohl from the women's hockey team from Amherst College, and you made the trip. How are you enjoying this game so far? It's really exciting. I've never been up to an Amherst Williams football game at Williams, and it's I had to do it before I graduated, so it's really exciting. You know, you hail from Chicago. Are you enjoying this New England college football classic rivalry? Yeah, it's great. Um, weather is cold, but that's all you can expect in the fall. It's really pretty up here. So women's hockey, you guys are doing very well. The season is upon us. Tell me what to look forward to for Amherst women's hockey. Yeah, so I think we have a really talented team this year. We've done really well in the past. We won a NESCAC championship my freshman year and made it to the finals last year. Um, and the NESCAC league is very competitive and deep. And as long as we work hard and stay committed, I think that this group of girls could do really well this season. And you guys are down. Williams just scored. How are you going to make a comeback here? Uh, I know a lot of the guys on this team, and I know they really want to win this one and end their season with a win, and I know they're going to dig deep and give it all they've got. Well, Kate Pohl, congratulations. Best of luck on Thank the you. ice. Back to you guys in the booth. It's a credit to both student sections that they make the trip for a game like this, and as we have seen so far, it really has been one of those uh, back-and-forth battles. The question is, can Amherst answer now the momentum clearly in the favor of Williams. Absolutely, and yeah, there is such great camaraderie, you know, with all these teams. Uh, most of the teams come out to support one another. That's uh, one great thing about uh, being able to call games in the NESCAC. It's, it's that kind of camaraderie. On the toss this time, cuts it inside, does uh, Echelkamp, and Met on the tackle. And so it sets up a third and long. And Justice McGrail, number 35, again coming up with a huge tackle. He is uh, just a first-year player out of Methuen, Massachusetts, and he has uh, been really outstanding in his first Williams Amherst game. And this is not what you want to see if you're Amherst, your number one wideout, Owen Gatos, hobbling to the sideline. So it'll set up a third and 10 coming up from the 17-yard line. Amherst trying to avoid a three and out. Piazza wants to throw. Jackson with the pressure and has to throw it away, but great pressure up front there by Calvin Jackson along with C.J. Vilfort, two of the top three in front for Williams. Yeah, both juniors, both have great size, but both have good flexibility and mobility too, and they put some big pressure there on Piazza who had to just throw it away. Piazza now 9 of 11 for just... 53 yards, and this will be great Mitchell field position coming up for Williams. As Mitchell on hand for the punt. So Williams will have possession with the lead as we send it right back down to Harry. Kiara Tan joining us. She hails from Canada, but she considers herself a New Englander, the captain of the Williams track team and a sprinter. And we are having a wonderful time here. So, All right, so as we deal with the technical difficulties, we'll get back down to Harry in just a moment. First and 10 from the 46 as Williams and Dan Vaughn begin this series with a four-point lead. Off the fake, Williams and Vaughn right up the middle, just a yard short of the first down, so a nice run of nine by Dan Vaughn. Had a great fake there on the fake handoff to Cameron Lee. That allowed Vaughn, as he drew the attention off to the right, to be able to slip up to the middle and get uh, nine yards. So quickly back to the line of scrimmage is Vaughn. Gives it off to Nicholas on the handoff. Flag comes in. It'll be a first down for Nicholas if the penalty is not against Williams College. We'll find out in just a moment. I think it might be a hold against Michael Bedard, number 44.
So it sets the ball back to the 45 of Williams. And those are the mistakes you have to try to avoid in a game of this magnitude, especially against your rival. Uh, penalties and turnovers, those are always the key to any game. And a couple of times it's uh, hurt Williams in this game. Motion at the line as the flags come in. It's going to be a false start against Williams. That goes against Talon Gorelli, senior out of West Hampton, Massachusetts, one of the seniors that was honored before the game. And again, I go back to that conversation this week with Mark Raymond and E.J. Mills about how the fact that not many times do you smile on your face in certain moments. One of these can be those moments in a victory against your rival. Oh, absolutely. Always, always a lot of fun in these games, and uh, it's, uh, it's a game that they all wait for. Pass completed to Nicholas, who's been adding that portion of his game this season after being a running back for the first three years for Williams, but it will set up a third and nine coming up from the 47 yard line. I think for both these coaches, they realize that uh, these are the kind of memories that are going to last a lifetime for them and to really just kind of sit back and enjoy the moment. I think both of them are being able to do that here today. Sam Jaffe, 46, man in motion for Williams. Low snap. Vaughn finds a striding to Gasparitz. Tries to make his way towards the first down marker. He's going to come up short. What an outstanding catch. He, he basically caught that with one hand, his left hand, as he was turning around. Not an easy play. And it was a very stiff pass, too, to DeGasparis and a great open field tackle there by Matt Mavalione. DeGasparis has been the number one target for Vaughn. Three catches for 48 yards, none bigger than that 29-yard touchdown reception. But on fourth and two, Brown back out for another punt. And instead, a loss on it, and Amherst comes up with the force of turnovers on downs. What a play on special teams. And Amherst is going to take over possession in great field position. So that was a direct snap back, looked like to C.J. Vilford, but I don't know if that was what they intended to do there. I think it was just a mistake, and Vilford ended up with the football, and uh, just not a good play there for Williams. Again, this is what a rivalry game like this comes down to, costly mistakes, and you saw one there by Williams. So Amherst will be working with a first and 10 from the Williams 45-yard line. Four wide out set, Piazza. Looks left, near side, pass complete towards the 40-yard line, brought down at the 39. Once again, is Carter Jung, the first-year player out of California. And Brant Mandia and George Papadopoulos in on the tackle. You can see Papadopoulos uh, upset with himself, but did a nice job to contain him, but only uh, picking up six yards. Piazza, 10 of 13 in this game, 59 yards passing. Has rushed for another 13 yards. Piazza wrapped up at the 40-yard line. Ian Devine, once again, we've heard his name called a couple of times. Tim Landolfi also in on the tackle. Yeah, Landolfi just read that play perfectly, and he met him just at the right time. And, you know, again, Piazza is kind of a slippery guy, but uh, couldn't get away from Landolfi. He was just able to wrap him up down low. We're starting to see now the sun come out. It's been a little bit overcast all day long. Typical New England weather midway through November in this rivalry game. It's going to be third and five coming up as we approach the final five minutes of this third quarter. Robert's in motion. Piazza looking downfield to Young and batted away in the secondary by Justice McGrail, first year cornerback out of Massachusetts and sets up fourth down. Boy, he just 
stayed with the very speedy Carter Jung perfectly right there. And again, for a first year player, what great poise. McGrail has been on at a number of different tackles and comes up with a huge play here. This could have definitely been a score. Deciding to go for it is Amherst and Piazza. And flags come in. And because of that false start, Amherst now forced to bring on the punting unit. So that was going to be a direct snap back to Chad Peterson, the senior quarterback number seven who was out there. But again, all for naught here for Amherst as they'll have to kick it away. It's going to be the fifth punt for Michael Mitchell, who's been averaging just under 32 yards per punt this afternoon. John Orris back to receive the punt, fair catch signaled. And a bounce that goes into the end zone. So Williams is going to start from their own 25-yard line. What a rivalry game we've had in store. Williams holding on to the lead over Amherst. Amherst in the 136th uh, playing of the biggest little game in America. A lot of noteworthy figures that have been a part of this rivalry over the years. You cannot forget Dick Farley, 114 wins, college football Hall of Famer, five perfect seasons. What a legendary career he had for Williams College. Yeah, 849 winning percentage over the course of his career and so many great stories, so many fantastic quotes. Some you can't say on TV, but he was a very <laughs> colorful guy. Williams working with a 14 to 10 lead, 445 left to play in this third. As Vaughn on the keep, working his way for a gain of five. And Vaughn, that dual threat quarterback, the leading rusher this year for Williams' offense. Nice job by the left tackle, Tim Forth there. He created just enough room for him to pick up an important five yards deep in their own territory. Vaughn, one of four quarterbacks this year under center for Williams. Made his first career start this season against Trinity, who wrapped up the NESCAC, looking to cap off a perfect season at 9-0. And yeah, Trinity had a great battle with Middlebury at the time. Both teams were undefeated, and uh, that one went right down to the wire. Nicholas off the toss. Pushed out of bounds, no gain on the play. Again, this has been a quarterback carousel for Williams. Jack Dickinson started the season, suffered a season-ending shoulder injury. Jack Wallace, the freshman, stepped in. He, too, was out with injury. Nick Owens has also seen some action in a couple of series as well. But the mainstay throughout the season really has been Vaughn at the quarterback spot. On third and five, pitches to Nicholas, who goes up the middle, and he is going to be tackled just short of the first down. Yeah, Raymond Dixon, the junior out of New Rochelle, New York, on the tackle there, number three for Amherst. Nice job of getting down by the legs and upending him for just a short gain. 
Mark Raymond told us this week that the philosophy and the game plan that has to be executed properly is you've got to generate a consistent running game to open up the passing attack. And we've seen that at times, certainly opening series for Williams in this third quarter. But since then, Williams has struggled as Brown is out once again for another punt, this time his fourth of the day. Takes a Williams bounce all the way down to the 24-yard line. And that is where Amherst's offense is going to start with 2.30 left to go in this third quarter. You see number 26, Elijah Parks, uh, trying to put a little wind behind it to get it to go a little bit farther. And uh, now this is good position here, a good, uh, good punt there for Brown. Well, we have the chance. Let's send it back down to Harry Chickma. Here with Spencer Spivey, the captain of Williams basketball. You're also a movie music star writing uh, screenplays, music. So tell me, how's your final year going on campus? Yeah, it's good. We got um, we got a big team, 17 guys this year. I just completed a big uh, movie project for my thesis here. And so now I'm hands off in all basketball. That's kind of the, the vibe from now. You know, uh, football's a big time sport, of course, basketball as well. So how are you inspired by the guys out here in this historic matchup against Amherst? Yeah, I mean, Every time you play Amherst, you, you get up big. And when, when we play Amherst in basketball, it's the game of the year. And I always bring you know a little extra oomph to it. Uh, I know football, we've had a kind of an ugly record. But this is like a great opportunity. End of the year, go on the right note, you know, celebrate, beat these guys' asses. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, you're from San Francisco. You've come all the way here to the East Coast. How has your four-year career been as a basketball player? Yeah. you know. Going across the country is a big move, like family-wise, weather-wise, um, and yeah, the the family that I have here, which is the basketball team, is just one of the brightest spots of my life, and I'm really happy that I made the move. And my grandma is actually from around here, so you know, there, there's a real family vibe that that brought me out here. Fantastic. And what are your plans after college? You mentioned you want to head to the Big Apple uh, down south, maybe have a great uh, career in music yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, I think sports and music go hand in hand a lot, and I get a lot of the same kind of zone and juice out of making music. So I hope that's the next step for uh, for me in life. Spencer, congratulations on a great career you. on the courts, also in the classroom. Let's head it back up to you guys in the booth. Great, thanks so much. As Piazza's pass complete, Robert's brought down for a gain of one and. To going back to what Spencer had just said, I, I haven't heard of a basketball team have 17 guys on it in quite some time. Yeah, yeah. 17 guys. That is a that is a long bench to utilize. It sure is. A, a real nice luxury for, for Williams College, and they've always had an outstanding basketball program here. Mitchell back on hand for a punt in a, a series that really didn't go the way for Amherst. Great defense presented up front. In fact, Piazza nearly had one of his passes intercepted. That was Campbell Pang who almost came up with the interception. And this time, Orris goes out of bounds at the 30-yard line. That is where Williams will start their offensive possessions. We take a timeout with one minute to go in this third quarter. Williams 14 to 10 lead on Amherst and even one minute to go in this third quarter the 136th edition of the biggest little game in America and you're someone John that has been around the NESCAC for for quite some time knowing the type of rivalries that we have seen throughout college football what makes this one so special 
Well, I think, uh, you know, the fact that these are really student athletes, I mean, the, the, the fact that these uh, players, you know, are just students first and athletes second, they really appreciate the fact that they can come out here on the field and play against their big rivals, and they're just so good. As Vaughn, pass over the middle, complete to Michael Bedard, just his first catch of the season. And Bedard, on that reception, sets up a first down for Williams. And I love the sportsmanship between the two teams, too. You, know, you don't see much ugliness in these rivalries. It's just good, hard football. Vaughn, 6 of 9 through the air, 84 yards and one interception. For the first down spotted at the 48-yard line of Williams. Nicholas to the outside, stiff arms, one defender, a second one, gets the first down right in front of the Amherst bench. What a run by Joe Nicholas. Yeah, a couple of real good uh, stutter steps there. Kemet Fisher, the first year out of Laurel, New Jersey, found himself, uh, well, in a tough spot there, and he was able to finally catch up to him, but a great job by Nicholas, and look at that speed. 19 carries for 102 yards, and that takes us to the end of the third quarter. Williams, 15 minutes away from wrapping up a third straight home victory in this rivalry, will step aside. Williams leading Amherst 14 to 10. The biggest little game in America has reached the fourth quarter. Williams with a 14 to 10 lead on Amherst. Williams now driving into Amherst territory. As we start off this fourth quarter, who is gonna come away with the bragging rights for the rest of the year? Vaughn, screen pass, opposite side. And it'll be a loss on the reception by Cameron Lee, who really has been a non-factor in this game today, John. Yeah, that's uh, one of the very few catches he's had here today. Great job there uh, by Harmon, uh, Miles Harmon, on the tackle there for Amherst. So try to, just a quick little screen pass off to the right side. Didn't work here for Vaughn and company. It's gonna be a loss of three on that play. Vaughn on the pitch, Nicholas, who's got over 100 yards to his name. And he is met by three or four Amherst defenders and only a gain of one, but Nicholas today has rushed the ball effectively, 21 carries for 112 yards. And uh, Tim Swope there, you see him with that, uh, you know, that uh, 
bandage on his uh, right uh, hand there. He has been a real big factor, and that's got to be tough when you're trying to bring a player down like that, and he is a right-handed player too, and uh, did a real nice job of reading the play. So a crucial play to start off this fourth quarter on this drive, third and 13 coming up for Vaughn and company. Nicholas, and he is met quickly. And Amherst defense once again up to the challenge. Kemet Fisher, the first year player out of Laurel, New Jersey, and that's gonna bring on the punting unit with Tim Brown coming out for now what would be his fifth punt of the game. Yeah, Kemet Fisher had a real nice game at Tufts University earlier this year at a forced fumble. Graduated from the Petty School. He's from Laurel, New Jersey in his first year for Amherst College. Jones once again back to receive for Amherst. Fair catch signaled at the 15 yard line and so Amherst is gonna work. Down by four to Williams and again, this has been a rivalry that Started back in 1884, both these teams for the first time since 2016 entered this rival game with, with losing records. It's something that you, you don't see very often. You normally see some great competition throughout the season leading into this game. Yeah, these teams have always been so traditionally good. Uh, as a matter of fact, Amherst, this team has not finished with a season under three wins since going back to 1992. So DJ Mills would love to get a win to close out the season. Williams leading the all-time series 74, 56, and 5. Last year coming away with the win. Off of play action, Piazza hit hard in the backfield on the incomplete pass. Give credit to Papadopoulos, who applied that hit on Piazza, sets up second down. Yeah, little plays like that to really go a long way, and Papadopoulos has really provided that uh, for Coach Raymond throughout the year. He's a first-year player, too. He hails from Virginia. Outstanding play to get to the quarterback Piazza there. Four wide receiver set. Sam Gerber, the man in motion, 83 in white. Pressure comes. Piazza almost intercepted, batted down. That was another great rush there by Papadopoulos and uh, Jackson, Calvin Jackson was the guy that was almost there to grab it. Number 97. So this would be a huge stance for Williams defense if they can try to force Amherst with another three and out. Empty backfield for Piazza, five wide out set. Looking downfield, has a man in stride. Pass incomplete, but a flag comes in. Owen Gatos, the number one wideout for Amherst, was the intended receiver. Let's see what the flag has gone. Looks like it's gonna be pass interference, I think, against Papadopoulos, and uh, my Papadopoulos is pretty upset with the call, but you know, could have gone either way there. So Amherst bailed out on the pass interference call against George Papadopoulos, the first year free safety out of Falls Church, Virginia. And it gives new life with the ball spotted at their own 30 yard line. And you see just that little bit of contact just as the pass was gonna be coming down that Papadopoulos did, that was the deciding factor in the call. Again, these mistakes at costly times. Gerber, flea flicker. And intercepted, out of bounds. Chaz Cotton there, the senior out of Los Angeles, comes up with the interception. Amherst tried to go with some trickery, and in the end it cost them a turnover. Well, they tried to get Oxenhurt to uh, toss that on the misdirection, and again, Chaz Cotton, the senior out of Los Angeles, who's had an outstanding year, 26 solo, 18 assists. Got one sack this year, and now he's got an interception as well. 
Cotton, his second interception of the season, gives the ball back to Williams at their own 45-yard line. What a turn of events after the pass interference call. Vaughn. Sees a lane up the middle, past midfield, into Amherst territory. A gain of nine. And Luke Harmon out of Washington, D.C. on the tackle there for Amherst College. But uh, Vaughn, boy, he is, boy, talk about Nicholas feeling his oats. Dan Vaughn sure is. Think about the course of events. Amherst gets bailed out by a pass interference call. They try to go with some trickery. Instead, it costs them with the interception. And now Williams is trying to drive with the lead. Momentum swings have been uh, pretty immense. Vaughn with the lead blocker. Nicholas gets the first down and more as he is tackled at the 39-yard line. Vaughn in terms of rushing this afternoon, 15 carries, 65 yards. He's been averaging just a tick under four per carry. Handoff is to Nicholas, cuts it to the inside, breaks a few tackles to the outside, and he is finally brought down Near the 20-yard line, what a run for Joel Nicholas on a first down. Uh, talk about being slippery there. Nicholas was just outstanding, just able to break probably three, maybe four tackles before Andy Skrzynski was finally able to get him down. 18 yards on that last run by Nicholas, up to 23 carries for 132 yards. Play clock down to seven. Vaughn on the keep. Vaughn rushes, tackled by Spriggan. Yeah, it looked like Vaughn just kind of ran into his own man there beyond the offensive line, John Freeman. And uh, that's what kind of stopped him more than anything else. Gain of two, sets up a second and eight from the 19. An offense last season that was one of the tops in the NESCAC. Part of the reason why they finished off a perfect season at 9-0. and Nicholas takes it up the middle. Called a first down and more, and Nicholas has been carrying this offense here this afternoon for Williams. Yeah, he was able to break a tackle from Ben Taylor, number 35. Thought he had gotten a piece of him enough to take him down. But again, that uh, slipperiness of Nicholas has been uh, really a key here in the second half for Williams. What a way to put a stamp on your career. If you're Joel Nicholas, already now over 100 yards rushing in this game, over 500 in his senior year. First and goal, Nicholas. Tries to force his way through, but he's met by three or four Amherst tacklers. Yeah, among those Taylor and Andy Skrzynski, that time Taylor was able to get enough of them to stop him from getting too far there. But boy, you just imagine where this offense would be without Nicholas. Injury timeout on the field as they look to be tending to Ben Taylor while they do. Let's step aside, 9.08 left to play.
Beautiful afternoon in Williamstown, Massachusetts, as we take a look around the NESCAC uh, this afternoon and the great rivalry between Trinity and Wesleyan as Trinity trying to wrap up a perfect season. Yeah, they're looking to go 9-0 and just like Williams did last year. Uh, Middlebury College did it a couple of seasons before COVID in 2019. That was the first team to do so. And Trinity looks like they're on their way to maybe getting a 9-0 and season. Bates with the lead on Hamilton and Middlebury right now trailing to Tufts, but the story has been Williams' offense, thanks to their defense off the interception, a second and goal for Dan Vaughn and company. Vaughn off a of play action. Looks to the back of the end zone, and he had to Gasparis, but overthrew him. Yeah, some de decent coverage there by uh, Miles Harmon, number 20, there for Amherst College. And really a tough one, almost impossible one for DeGasparis to try to track down. And this is a tough spot, especially for the secondary for Amherst. You're playing with three first-year players in the secondary. Yeah, it's been a real adjustment for Coach uh, E.J. Mills. And, you know, after having some really stout defensive teams uh, throughout the year and a lot of experience, not quite as much this year. The crucial third and goal coming up for Vaughn with Lee in motion. Vaughn looking towards the end zone. Nearly lost the football right into the hands of Henry Walsh, the right tackle. That could have been a very scary play at an opportune time if you're Amherst, though. Yeah, Williams getting really lucky there with Vaughn and uh, just happened to be lucky that Henry Walsh was in the right place to be able to grab that after Vaughn got hit pretty hard. Shuren to kick, Vaughn to hold. So Vaughn's gonna hold for Shuren. And this will be about a 25 yard field goal attempt for Shuren, the sophomore lefty kicker. And it is perfect. So with that, Williams extends their lead to a touchdown now, leading Amherst 17 to 10, 8.05 left to play in one of the most historic rivalries in all of college football. Five left to play in this historic rivalry game between Williams and Amherst as Williams capping off an eight play drive culminating in a 26 yard field goal by Ivan Shuren to extend the lead on Amherst looking for their third straight home victory in this rivalry between the two and hoping to participate in the walk. This would be the 51st year that all the players on Williams would march through downtown Williamstown, singing the fight song with fans on both sides, one of the great traditions in all of college football. Oh, it is. Uh, it started back in November 13th of 1971. As you mentioned last year, the 50th anniversary, and the Eves would love nothing better on the 51st to be able to uh, take the walk again. Off the kickoff, fair catch signal by Amherst, and they will start down by a touchdown as we throw it back down on the sidelines to Harry Chickma. Javi from the baseball team, Charlotte field hockey for Amherst. You guys down by seven right now. You were telling me how bad you want this win. What's it going to take for your team to come back? I think we've been playing a really strong defensive game, and right now we just need to kick it into another gear and find it in us to go further. You're from the town of Amherst. How important is this game to you? 
It means a lot, you know. I grew up playing youth sports uh, around the College of Amherst. You know, developed a really strong connection. You know, to be a part of the rivalry really means a lot. Uh, you know, and it's a uh, it's a pride game. So you know, definitely it means a lot and something we'd uh, hope to win and uh, pull out here for sure. What does this rivalry mean to you? I mean, it's the most played NCAA Division three game in history. So this, you know, this rivalry is two centuries old. It's more than two centuries. So. It's more than just tradition, but we have people watching from all over the world. We have viewing parties in Tokyo, in New York City, in St. Louis. Like my dad is at a bar in Stanford right now watching it with Williams and Amherst alum. So it's about the community and the tradition, and I just want Amherst to pull it out here. Viewing party in Nashville as well. They sent a text message. They wanted a shout out. So best of luck to both teams. Good luck in the battle, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Appreciate it. Back to you guys. Harry, it's a reason why. It's one of the best rivalries in all of college football. As we just saw before, that incomplete pass. Mike Piazza able to find Carter Jung for a significant gain that gave Amherst some new life. And down by a touchdown, what's the mindset if you're Amherst in their offense? You know, I think uh, you've got to let uh, Piazza kind of step up here and uh, see if he can find some of these receivers like he did with Carter Jung just a couple of minutes ago. I uh, was able to get away from Justice McGrail for a nice, uh, you know, nice pickup. So I think that's going to be one of the keys. This time it's Piazza keeping it himself, getting it to midfield for a gain of two. It's going to set up a crucial third and eight coming up with right now the clock being the biggest enemy for Amherst, 7-15 and counting. Had a real nice job by Ian Devine there. He got uh, his hand on the foot of the quarterback, Mike Piazza, took him down, or it could have been a, maybe four or five more yards picked up. Amherst five for 12 on third downs today. Empty backfield, Piazza. Quick throw over the middle, almost intercepted as Oxenhurt was his intended receiver. And it's going to send up a fourth down opportunity coming up. And the punting unit comes back onto the field for Amherst. That was going to be almost an impossible catch for Oxenhurd as he had right there Colston Smith among uh, two defend defenders there waiting to uh, maybe make the interception. But just a real tough uh, pass there. Oxenhurd has really no chance to catch that. Mitchell back on hand, what will be now his seventh punt of the game. John Orris. First year player out of Cheshire. Back to receive for Williams. Fair catch signaled and into the end zone. So Williams will be working with a lead. 6.42 left to play in this one between Amherst and Williams. John Brickley alongside John Lawrence, Harry Chickma, great to have you with us on this Saturday, overcast day in New England in Williamstown, Massachusetts. The 136th edition of the biggest little game in America. Williams trying to wrap up would be a third straight home victory in this rivalry. They've got a touchdown lead starting from their own 20 yard line as Dan Vaughn, the senior quarterback on the keep, cuts it to the inside, to the middle. And he is brought down for a gain of three. Luke Harmon on the stop there for Amherst. It looked like uh, Vaughn kind of slipped just a little bit on his initial start of that run. So it was good that he at least was able to pick up three yards. 18 carries for Vaughn, 74 yards.
Vaughn on the give to Nicholas. To the outside, he's got some room into the secondary. Down the sideline and finally forced out of bounds, but what a run and what a day for Joel Nicholas. I'll tell you what, it all started with another great block by number 44, Michael Bedard, the tight end. And he has done this on a number of occasions for Nicholas today. And he just opened up a huge hole for him down that right side to get such a great yardage. Nicholas is having himself a career day. Closing in on 200 yards on the ground this afternoon in his final game in a Williams uniform. Sets up a first and 10 from the Amherst 33. Nicholas, the handoff up the middle, down to the 30 yard line. And again, here is Bedard. Watch what he does here as he takes out two Amherst players. And that just has one guy back now, Charles McKissick. And McKissick just able to get enough to force him out of bounds. That run for Nicholas, 44 yards. Followed it up with a three yard run as we are under five minutes to go in this historic rivalry. Vaughn on the give, Nicholas to the outside, met by two tacklers. Amherst expecting it the entire way, and will set up a third down coming up. Luke Harmon, along with his brother Miles Harmon, two brother combinations on the defensive side for Amherst. Now Nicholas just a few yards short of 200 for the game at 192. Two receiver set, Nicholas to the left off the shotgun formation. Hand off to the senior as he plows ahead and it's going to be close to a first down. And this is what Williams wants to continue to do. Keep moving the chains, keep getting that clock down to almost nothing. You don't give Amherst another opportunity to come all the way down the field to get that tying score. See the numbers by Nicholas, 29 carries, almost 200 yards on the ground, and a fourth and one that could really seal this up for Williams if they can convert. One for two on fourth down this afternoon. The Gasparis in motion. Vaughn with a block ahead in the form of Nicholas gets the first down. And fans here at Farley Lamb Field are getting closer to seeing the walk for the 51st time in this rivalry. And this is where Williams has been so good this year. Coming into this game, they were 7 of 14 on fourth down conversions. And you can see why, again, with that dual threat of Nicholas and Vaughn in the backfield, that uh, really spells trouble for the opposing defense. Yeah, those numbers, number one in the NESCAC, comes up at a crucial time on fourth down. So play clock is down to three for Vaughn. And it doesn't appear that he got the snap off on time. In fact, actually a timeout taken by Williams with 2.27 left to go. It's been one of those scenarios, John, that we've talked about before. Each team making crucial plays. We'll talk about that more with a timeout on the field. 2.27 left to play here in Williamstown.
Williams trying to close out Amherst for a third straight year in the biggest little game in America. They have a 17-10 lead on Amherst with 227 left to go after a crucial fourth down conversion. Nicholas, who's closing in on 200 yards, gets a gain of a couple, and we spotlighted before a number of plays that have really swung the momentum on both sides, whether it be forced interceptions, forced turnovers, or as we've seen, timely conversions on fourth down. Well, I think the pass interference that uh, Amherst got, you thought maybe it was going to work in their direction. Then you got the interception by Chaz Cotton. I think that was a huge, huge play here in this quarter that uh, really swung the momentum back Williams' way. So a timeout taken with 2.22 left to play. Again, if you're just joining us, the 136th edition of Amherst and Williams, a tradition that goes all the way back to 1884. And What's noteworthy about this rivalry is the walk. And if you're a Williams grad or someone affiliated with Williams, you know what I'm talking about. We've, we've discussed it before, but they're trying to come up with the walk for the 51st year, where if they come away with the win, they're going to march downtown Williamstown, singing the fight song with fans on hand and almost like a parade style. That's a tradition you don't see very much in college football. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Coach Mark Raymond, too, after he lost his first uh, Williams Amherst game in 2016, he actually took the walk himself and counted the steps, 573 steps, and they have it stitched on the sides of their jerseys. On second and seven, Nicholas to the outside, and he will get closer to a first down. And it can't be understated, the type of performance Joe Nicholas who has battled through injuries this year 30 carries on the day almost 200 yards and he's averaging almost seven yards a carry yeah again you do you just don't know where this offense would be without uh, Joel Nicholas here in this game he has provided all this time to be knocked off the clock here for Williams so another timeout taken 215 left to play in this game Williams, who coached by Mark Raymond, who has had success at home in this rivalry against Amherst in his sixth season, trying to make it 3-0 at home. And we touched upon the fact that he, he came into a situation where in his first year, Williams went 0-8. And just last year, they capped off a perfect season with a NESCAC championship. And then on the other side, you've got E.J. Mills, who's been around this program for over a quarter of a century. Yeah. And he has seen almost every type of rivalry, but this one obviously, no doubt, second to none in his coaching career. Third and two from the 12-yard line. Lee in motion. Vaughn takes it up the middle himself, gets the first down, sets up a first and goal as we close upon two minutes to go in this game. Boy, another outstanding job by number 54, Tim Forth. He just opened up all kinds of room there, and that is huge as the clock continues to move here. And not a lot of opportunities here for Amherst. Vaughn on the day, nearly 93 yards to his credit on the ground, almost 100 on 21 carries. And he has really come up at crucial junctions on this drive. Play clock is down to two, and Vaughn and the East are going to have to be forced to burn a timeout with each team having one timeout remaining. Well, you can see Coach Mark Raymond, he was really upset that they had to burn that timeout right there. You could see on the look on his face and his arms waving that he was upset by that. It's amazing to think what has happened with this program for Williams in terms of the quarterback spot? How many times in a season do you hear of a team having to go through four quarterbacks? Not very often, not very often. And the fact that he had Dan Vaughn who played uh, quarterback at Belmont Hill back in high school, that was such a great luxury for him. And for Vaughn to be able to come in after not taking any snaps as quarterback, primarily just a running back throughout the course of his career here at Williams, to be able to step in and do what he's done, it's been uh, nothing short of outstanding. Yeah, made his first career start versus Trinity. By far his 
best performance of the year was against Bates. He had five touchdowns total, culminating in Conference Player of the Week honors. Trying to put this one away for Williams. Nicholas and Amherst defense up front anticipating the run the entire time. Nicholas, Another great job there by Andy Skrzynski, who's got an interception himself, and a great job to stop the run there. And that's what uh, this Amherst team is going to have to do, continue to be stout defensively here, but time running out on them. Amherst is going to burn their final time out, it appears. Uh, with 1.28 left to go in this game on a second and goal. So really, Williams can take their time and try and just burn the clock and run it down to zero. That's right. And when you got uh, Nicholas and Vaughn uh, back there to uh, be able to do that, that's exactly the type of thing you want to do here for Williams in the final minute 28. And uh, those two players can can really kind of take more time off the clock. And e even if you give the ball back here, they've run so much time down, it's going to be really tough for Amherst to try to mount an attack the other way. I was just thinking to myself about the perplexing situation if you're Mark Raymond. Do you try to go for a quick score to real seal the, the victory? Or do you try to run a play or two and, and run that clock down as much as possible and settle for a field goal? I would probably try for the score, but that's why I'm not down on the sidelines <laughs> and he is. But probably the safer bet would just to run a couple of safe plays and, and go for the field goal. Second and goal, Nicholas cuts it to the outside, forcing his way towards the pylon, will not get there, and it will be third and goal coming up. Well, you can see Nicholas really wanted that to, to cap off his uh, Williams career there. It took three players finally to force him out of bounds. And think about this, it stopped the clock at 120. Yep, that's a big play. Two yards on that last carry by Nicholas. You just get the sense that Vaughn really wants his senior teammate to go out with a touchdown. Hey, you see the confidence of a guy like Nicholas, too, thinking, hey, I can do this. And I think that's why he went where he went. Play clock down to three. Vaughn is going to carry it himself, and he is going to be short of the end zone. But the clock still running, 112 and counting. Another outstanding play by number 16, Andy Skrzynski there, getting the tackle on Vaughn. Vaughn looked a little unsure at first, but uh, decided to sprint ahead, and Skrzynski was the guy who was able to get the stop. Well, this will be interesting to see what Mark Raymond wants to do on a fourth and goal situation. He's going to have 33 seconds left if he runs the play clock all the way down. So Mark Raymond takes his final timeout with 33 seconds left to go on the clock. And Shuren's going to come out to pretty much ice this victory if he connects on this field goal. That could be the third in a row here for Williams. Uh, the E fans here have been on their feet for the past couple of minutes. Is, uh, again, the momentum is kind of going back and forth in this game. But I, I think, again, that uh, interception by Chaz Cotton was really one of the big uh, plays in the game. And, of course, Joel Nicholas has just been a monster out there today. 33 rushes for 206 yards, and uh, he's, he's been the story here. So if Williams does prevail in this game, they would earn their 75th win in this rivalry. Third straight overall and third in a row at home. So Shuren is on hand for the field goal attempt. This is going to be, in essence, a chip shot. A 19-yarder, it looks to be. Vaughn the holder. Kick is up, and it is good. And Williams is 30 seconds away from taking down their arch rival.
Boy, Coach E.J. Mills threw everything he had at that to try to get the block. Luke Harmon, who got up slowly, and he was rushing to the outside to the right, was looking to get a block, but couldn't get there in time. Outside of an unforeseen situation happening, it's almost certain that Williams is going to lock up this victory at home against Amherst. Sharon, who has come on strong last year, was a first team all conference player, was eight for eight in terms of field goals. And here, we thought it was interesting. E.J. Mills has been around this rivalry for quite some time. He said, special teams, it's going to be coming down to crucial moments, just like what we just saw. Yeah, there really was a chip shot for Ivan Shuren, his longest 42-yarder, uh, which came earlier in the season against the Hamilton Continental. So he's, uh, he's really good under pressure. What a game we've seen, though. Really a defensive battle, timely offensive plays. Mike DeGaspers' 29-yard touchdown. One of the key moments offensively for Williams, but you've alluded to it time and time again. Chaz Cotton, that interception really swung the momentum back into the favor of Williams. And the final 30 seconds, this one will be returned. And Amherst will work with just 24 seconds to go. So looking for a miracle if you're Amherst and if you're Williams, just don't make a costly mistake. That's right, and uh, this team has got enough experience with guys like uh, Ian Devine and you know Tim Forth that uh, you know I don't foresee that happening right here. But uh, you know, just an outstanding uh, job by these seniors here that were honored for Williams at the start of the game, and looks like they're going to get rewarded here with a victory here in this 136th meeting. Empty backfield for Amherst. Piazza with the short throw. Out of bounds. Robert's with the completion. Just a sophomore, so he'll be back, you know, along with Piazza. He'll come back for his senior year. There's a lot of talent still on this roster for Amherst to build forward. But Amherst is going to fall to Two and seven on the season. Williams is going to wrap up the year three and six, and more importantly, give the seniors one last victory. In a game that they'll take to their grave, John. Absolutely. You know, you look down this lineup, uh, there has to be at least uh, 12 seniors on this Williams team that are going to be able to enjoy this here today. You see a guy like Ian Devine, he's trying to get the crowd pumped up here in the final few seconds of the game and yeah this is something you just try to soak in you try to just enjoy the moment I know it's tough to do sometimes but you hope the players can do that even the players here on Amherst who will come out on the short end of it and the fans here in Williamstown rooting for Williams College 15 seconds away from seeing the walk in downtown Williamstown a parade style if you will as 10 seconds still remain on the clock and for both these teams, no doubt disappointing, but at the same time, a chance to reflect, bring back some good talent, and look forward. Yeah, and both these coaches are such great recruiters that I have no doubt that uh, they will more than improve on this year's performance. And these two teams, before you'll know it, they'll be back in the mix among some of the best in the NESCAC. Last 10 seconds, Piazza once again. Robert's three straight receptions for him. Down to the final five seconds. And again, we talk about rivalries. Harvard, Yale, Michigan, Ohio State. When you're here and you feel this rivalry and you hear from various student athletes and the respective presidents and the athletic directors it's it's certainly a unique and rare experience and a rare feeling as well could be the final play of the game as the pass complete out of bounds with just one second to go and 
and Carter Jung getting it from the Williams uh, faithful here in Williamstown. But hey, you got to give Amherst credit, you know, playing right to the bitter end here. So all the, all the credit in the world to this uh, Amherst team. Final play of the game as Williams is going to come away with a victory over their rival. Piazza, one final snap. And Jung wrapped up out of bounds, and that will do it. In a tradition that began back in 1884, Williams, for the third straight year, can celebrate a victory over their rival in Amherst. Once again, our final score, Williams taking down Amherst 20 to 10. For my partner, John Lords, our sideline reporter, Harry Chickma, and our hard-working crew, I'm John Brickley. Thanks so much for joining us. Williams coming away with the victory in the 136th edition of the biggest little game in America. As we say, so long from Williamstown, Mass.